Sonia, thank you so much for joining us. So Sonia is CEO of Walola, um, Sonia Neri, and we are so happy to have you here because we want to kind of learn about your experience to date as a founder uh, when you started up um, and then kind of taking us through your journey. So can you talk to us about your background first of all? Yeah, sure. Uh, lovely to meet you all. Um, I'm Sonia Neri. My company is Walola. I'm the CEO at Walola. Uh, in terms of my background, I'm a chartered physiotherapist by trade. I'm a really big believer that people should be cared for in the comfort of their own homes, if at all possible. And that sort of underpins the, the vision of the company and, and the product that we've built. Okay, super. Yeah. So from physiotherapy <laughs> to founding a company. So yeah. where was the leap into entrepreneurship? And was, it, was there always an inkling there or was it just a need base? So wh when did that moment happen? Yeah, I suppose so. Probably like a lot of the audience, um, you know, we are specialists in our fields and we find problems and pain points and we potentially go, you know what, this, there might be a better way to do this. Um, and how it began for me is that I <clears throat> had worked in the HSC for about 13 years and I set up a physio at home company. So we kind of contracted with VHI and uh, built a team of physiotherapists working in people's homes. But while they were in people's homes, they didn't have the means to kind of manage data securely on the move. And so that was around about 20, God, I want to say 2016. Um, and the first sort of MVP that we built was a, a product that allowed, you know, technologically uh, physiotherapists to securely carry data with them. Uh, it was secured in the cloud, but they could manage patient records, patient appointments, patient payments, and so on on the move. Now, you know, skip forward to 2023, our product is totally different. We pivoted on multiple occasions, and now what we have is a patient communications platform. So it faces the patient, and it integrates with those core clinical systems in the hospital to allow data to be shared in multiple ways securely. Um, you know, the big return on investment is that it's reducing the need for patients to come into the hospital or to come back for follow-up. Um, but yeah, primarily our customer base is in the UK now and it's NHS or private sector. Um, but yeah, I identified a particular pain point and sort of sense checked it against a couple of others, you know, other physiotherapists that were working in the arena and, you know, then kind of did a couple of different things to support myself to um, verify, I suppose, my assumptions around a product market fit. Um, and it began with a local enterprise office, gave us a priming grant. I put a business plan together you know, sort of to understand, you know, is the problem that I'm having the problem that others are having as well? Um, and I also set about educating myself. So I participated in, a pro uh, I don't know if it's still available, it was a program at the time called New Frontiers. Yeah, that's still. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. So I participated in phase one of that program. And again, what that did was it forced me to really interrogate, you know, is this, is this a big enough market? Is, is, is the you know, need a, a big enough need? Um, is my resolution or my solution, uh, you know, the right solution and so on? And so that kind of process, I suppose, of securing some funding to give me the safety net and educating myself and then interrogating on repeat what I had assumed was what I did over a couple of years. So I then went on to, you know, New Frontiers Phase 2. But with Enterprise Ireland, I got so much more, you know, than that initial investment because we then went on to get something called High Potential Startup Unit Funding. Um, and they also have this kind of consistent uh, support from my business. Like, so we availed of something called the SEF Fund. Uh, we're now an SME and we're looking at something called the RD&I Fund, you know, up to a million in, in supports is what you can bring in. It, it matched. Um, and then they also have these educational, you know, programs. I'm constantly uh, educating myself. You know, the, the most recent one I did was a VC boot camp, which was a week long, and they really did a deep dive into what is the VC landscape at the moment. You know, what materials you need to prep, all that'll be stuff. So, yeah, it's far more than the money. It's 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 the network that it has brought for me. Yeah. Can we just take a step back? So I do <laughs> want to go through the kind of initial onboarding of customers, but just yeah. just for your personal journey. So you're, you're out there, you're a physiotherapist, you can see a pain point, you are identifying it. And that, you know, do you feel like you have gone on a journey in terms of your own skill set? And, and where do you think your strengths lie 
you know, and has your mindset shifted or, you know, in terms of being a founder to a CEO and now running a business? So can you talk to me about that personal journey? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is, it is, I suppose, and you probably all can relate, quite a lonely journey. And I think it's really important early on to sort of, if you can, bolster yourself with the right people. Um, and that's challenging on a budget, you know, so like, you know, you, your, your Leo priming grant maybe just about gets you over the line where you can give up your day job to do it yourself. But little by little kind of building out on the team is, is, is really key. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the, the, the couple of things that I did was, you know, I identified a potential co-founder when I was on that New Frontiers program and he came in. Um, he had been building a different product in a different company and we joined forces and, and he kind of collaborated with me. Um, so, and and I, I participated in programs such as Going for Growth. Uh, prior to that, I did Starting Strong. So again, it was about bolstering myself to kind of you know, <laughs> deal with what can be quite a challenging position you know, with as much support as I could, be they gratis supports in the form of kind of female founders supporting female mm -hmm. founders or identifying kind of team members that might come on board because they understood the vision of what it was I was trying to build. So I think you were quite proactive because some people do set, spend that lonely couple of first year or two on their own, not really knowing what to do. So I think <clears throat> platforms like those, programs like those that are provided are great to engage with. I think, you know, in, in terms of just like-minded individuals, but also yeah. getting the mentoring that you might need. So then, um, in terms of the first onboarding of the kind, when did you get that moment where you were feeling this is it? Was it the CSF funding or was it when somebody, you know, actually said, right, I want to, I want to invest this or is it, was it kind of customer based? Yeah, it, it really, um, for me, the most exciting point was quite a few years in, you know, so there is actually like, like, like you need to kind of boast yourself up that it's not a sprint, it's a marathon and there's going to be like every day is going to be, you know, yo-yoing from the good stuff to the low stuff. Um, so yeah, I mean, the first, the, the challenge is going from zero to one and for all of you, I think that kind of zero to one of who's your first customer, who's the person that you can say, I've, I've achieved the zero to one mark and for us, it was securing a contract with a trust in the UK called Birmingham Community NHS Foundation Trust and knowing that the product would be in the hands of approximately you know, three quarters of a million people, that's their target. Um, so that for me was a really big day, you know, and it's because because my goal really, you know, as a physio, I could maybe impact on a handful of patients, but with this, we can have, you know, have an impact on a much broader, you know, audience base. And, and, and so that was my big, you know, celebration. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then from that, then, did it start to snowball a little bit? Like once you got them, that you had that validation and then how quickly did you grow, you know, once you got to that? So how, how long did that take you? Two, one to two years to get to that point? So that happened in 2020. So yeah, we established the company in 2016, um, and it may be different for the audience here, but healthcare and fintech are the areas where you've got like a number of swim lanes that you're swimming in. It's not just about the product market fit and developing the product. Like it's very kind of regulatory and compliance based. You need to position yourself as a company on procurement frameworks. Um, so, so there is kind of probably a bit more red tape in my world than there may be in some of the verticals that these you know, yeah. audience members are playing in. And so that, that's why you know, it took us kind of four years for the first real you know, major contract to land. But were you kind of prepared for that because of the sector? <clears throat> I don't know if I was. Okay, you yeah. just kept yeah. yeah. going with optimism. <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah, I mean, I understood it would take time. I understood there was a, you know, a tight regulatory landscape. Um, I, 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 I vastly underestimated, if I'm honest, both the cost that it would take and the time that it would take to get to where we got to there. Yeah. I was going to ask you about the obstacles, <laughs> so we've obviously covered a few. So what do you think were the major obstacles in those first four years? Because it does sound like that was quite a journey in terms of... So what do you think were the, could you have sped that up? Was it like looking back or was it something that just took time? Um, I think it, it was a journey that we needed to go on. I, I do believe that there is quite a bit of work in iterating and validating and assessing the validity of your assumptions. That that takes time and it takes time to build a network of potential partners, potential customers that you can ask, that you can engage with, that, that trust you enough to say, yes, we're willing to put our hands in our pocket to, to give you funding. So um, yeah, it, it does take time. What could I have done sooner? Um, I mean, obviously, you know, everyone could do with more capital in sooner. Uh, yeah. Um, if I'd had greater funding early on, I might've been able to speed that process up. Um, 
I would have liked to have more of a team sooner as well. Like kind of, you know, it has, it, it's taken time to build out a team that, that I can really kind of say, yeah, these guys and girls are better than me in each of their skill sets. And that probably, we'll talk about funding now, but with that probably having that team might have onboarded funding sooner as well. Like yeah, it's kind of a chicken, chicken and egg. egg. Yeah. Correct. So talk to me about the funding today. So how did you fund it? Like what did you start off with? I know you got the feasibility, did the New Frontiers, which is a stipend. It's not very much, but it does kind of keep... Yeah, keep the lights on and keep you going. Mm -hmm. So was that just all, you know, very small grants starting small and then the CSF, you know, so the initial, how long did that last you then? Yeah, so we did, we did everything. Like I've, if any of you want to talk about grants, after this session, all night, yeah. I'm happy to like, there's a whole appendix. Like, <laughs> there's an appendix to my business plan. Um, but yeah, we did, yeah. we did everything. So we did, we did two grants with the Leo. So it was kind of a priming grant and then a feasibility grant from Leo. Uh, phase one and phase two of New Frontiers, competitive star fund. I did crowdfunding to co kind of to match the HPSC funding. And that was a really interesting journey. So, you know, I had always assumed crowdfunding was kind of for business to consumer products. You know, it, you know, back in the day, you'd get a, an early cut of the final for whatever, you know, uh, you know, investment you made in the crowdfund. Whereas um, Spark Crowd was an entity in Ireland that had just set up an equity platform. It's the only Irish equity platform. Yeah, and we were probably their third company or fourth company on there. The, the most recent kind of um, companies have raised in the region of three million on their platform. Whereas back when we were starting, it was a 100K, 200K sort of check sizes. Um, so yeah, that was quite unnerving because you're kind of putting yourself out there and saying, hey, these are my wares. You guys want to back me? And like, if they back you, great. But if they don't, it's also kind of quite a public arena to not be backed in. You know? Um, so yeah, so that was crowdfunding and HPSU matched that. Um, and then now we're into an arena where we've been uh, backed, and I just met Elliot in the, in the corridor there, business venture partners backed us uh, to the tune of a million about 18 months ago. And now we're in the process of closing another funding round with the Dublin-based VC and Enterprise Ireland are coming in potentially on what they call the ORDNI fund that I mentioned at the top of the meeting there. So yeah, um, we have required external funding, but now we're at a stage where revenues are really driving our growth for the next 18 to 24 months. And we shouldn't be seeking further investment for quite some time unless we open or identify another market. Okay, so just before we talk about where the company's at now, um, I'd like to know what you think investors look for, and we did talk about the team, but, you know, what, what are the pillars that you feel that they looked for in your company and then also for, in terms of lessons for others to, to hear? Yeah, sure, so, so it's really interesting because uh, we always followed a standard kind of problem, solution, you know, unique selling point, size of the market and financials. Um, and when I did the VC bootcamp, you know, they really kind of have, when they're looking at your deck, they pretty much spend like 90% of their time on the financials and the team. So like you have to have sort of rock solid understanding of the commercial elements. Like how does this business make money? What are the operating expenses? What are the margins? What are the you know markups? Uh, all of that needs to be explicitly clear and up front and center in how you you know communicate your business because while they are interested in you know novelty and you know uh, cutting edge technology, you know is this business a business that will give me my return on investment? The commercial element, yeah. yeah. Um, but definitely team is key. You know, so for us, um, repeatedly, like we're kind of commented on, you know, the, the experience of the team, my kind of C-level team are very clinical in orientation. So we have an epidemiologist, a CMO. We have another, interestingly, physiotherapist as our COO, etc. cetera. So, um, yeah, it's all about the team. And fundamentally, people buy from people and investors invest in people. Um, from what I hear, you yeah. know, I've never sat on the other side of the table, but not yet. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So, um, just talking about the team, you know, what what were your needs, you know, in terms of skills that you, I'm sure, you know, we, I talked earlier on about understanding self-awareness of what you are bringing to the table and what you're best served doing. So where is your focus now and, you know, where where do the team members lie and who have you kind of gathered around you to kind of bolster the business? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, we're a technical company, so we do have to have really strong technical leadership. Um, and we will be onboarding a new CTO. I'll be able to announce that in another month or so. Um, so for me, you know, I'm not a developer. I've always been good at sort of listening very closely to the customer. I speak their language. I'm in their world. Like the people that I'm engaging with on a daily basis are clinicians and administrative staff in hospital settings. So in a way, my skill is taking that and translating it into the specs that the technical side of the house deliver on. 
Um, it's always been founder-led sales. So again, commercially, um, I have a team, uh, an entity in the UK called Quiddity Health, for any of you that work in, in the space that I'm in, and they do the whole kind of discovery and early conversations with potential partners and customers, and then they bring them to, to me, and I close out on that. Um, and equally with partners, the same, I would be the face of the company when engaging with commercial partners that might help resell our product, for example. So I'm kind of the... Um, the yeah, front, the front. Yeah, the, <laughs> the front, front of it, the front yeah. door. I'm the commercial yeah. lead currently at the company, um, and I am the the translator in terms of requirements from customer to tech team. Um, I'd be very cognizant that I never trained as an accountant. I'm not a financial forecaster or a financial modeler in any way. So again, we have a really talented CFO whose core remit is to, you know, interrogate the financials at all times and prep us accordingly for future okay. growth and strategy. Um, so yeah, I mean. I, I, I think I speak the language and I'm a translator and I'm okay at the front of house side of things. Um, and I'm very cognizant that I'm not a technical lead and I'm not a financial whiz kid and therefore I need to have those kind of key pillars in my team that can help us in the next stage of growth. But again, I guess because you understand the business, you understand the concept and your the trust and authenticity is there. So then the team around you support all of those things. Agreed. Yeah. Um, talk to me about, we were talking about earlier about resilience resilience that you have needed, but also how you manage the work-life balance and have you at any point kind of faced burnout where you've had to just reset or, you know, just, just the journey in terms of that um, element, so resilience and work-life balance. Do you have any? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I think I have a lot of resilience. I don't know if I have a lot of work-life balance. Um, on the resilience front, um, I think it's really important to be vulnerable and be willing to sort of put your hand up and ask for help. And that can be help in any format, whether it's personally at home to say, hey, I actually need a hand with childcare or, hey, I need a hand with assessing, you know, the financial viability of this and asking the right people at any point in time. And, you know, that's the beauty of the networks that further bring, uh, that EI bring, that going for growth bring. Like people are, for the most part, you know, when you're asked for help, most people give the help and they're only too delighted. Do you know that kind of way? Um, so I think... It's about being open enough to say, yeah, I, you know, I'm doing the best I can here, but I actually need a, a pair of hands on this or that or the other. I think that's really key. I think the other thing that's key for me is that I've always really understood why I believe in this. Like, this is my vision. People should not be in a hospital unless they absolutely have to be. And I'm very, very, you know, so I think it's about uh, questioning yourself you know, at your core, what, what underpins this? You know, what is, the, okay, the product is over here, but why? What, you know, and I know Simon Sinek talks a lot about, you know, um, yeah, but the that purpose, is, yeah. yeah. The purpose and what. Yes, yeah, so if, if you're very key and uh, on your North Star and you know what that's all about, your journey might wander off a little bit and you might take a little bit of downtime and you might ask for a little bit of help, but you still know where you're going and that you can be very articulate in explaining that North Star to others and you can bring others underneath to kind of keep you afloat on the days when you feel you're sinking, you know? Yeah. So I was just going to ask you there about before the, looking into the future um, and your North Star and where it's going, um, Nuggets as you said there ask for help but what other nuggets of advice for everyone sitting here and people listening in you know from the journey that you've gone on yeah I always feel like gosh like this is where I always feel a little bit like a imposter syndrome <laughs> like it's in I'm still learning like I think you know we're always learning I'm always coming to these events and sitting in that chair and saying teach me please you know um so what are the nuggets I, I um gosh uh yeah, it is about being very clear about what it is you're doing and, and your why. And so on the days when you're having doubts, you can still sense check against that and go, you know, yeah, I'm still, I want to get out of bed and, and I want to work hard for this, you know. Um, and on the day when you realize that that is no longer the case, that might be the day for something else, you know. Okay. And so being very clear with yourself and having people around you that can, you know, hold you accountable to the kind of targets. Like be very clear about where the North Star is, but also the map to achieve that, like these are the targets that I need to achieve today or this week or this month, you know, smart goals, you know, measurable. And, and you can say, okay, well, have I achieved that? No, but I have achieved this. And therefore, you know, there is some positive yeah. angle on that. So yeah, the North Star, the targets, the vision, support every way you can get it in every direction you can get it. Um, yeah, and, and think ahead in terms of fundraising as much as you can. What can I avail of that's available as a grant? My local, my you know, national, you know, supports that are available. Yeah.
well. Um, and they are kind of for anyone who doesn't know the NHS, they're kind of different verticals within the NHS. So now for us, it's about really scaling within acute community mental health private sector uh, with the support of NHS England. Sorry. Um, and then we are looking at, you know, there is another market that we're exploring and we're probably going to take about 18 months to validate it. Um, and, you know, for me, you know, we did a really interesting project with the Trinity Masters students and we sort of said, look, this is our dream product market fit. Markets that have a unique health identifier, a telematic infrastructure, uh, a government mandate, funding pot, please find other markets for us that look like this. And they've kind of given us a target of where to go next. Unfortunately, Ireland isn't currently on that list because we don't meet many of those standards. Um, but I'm hoping to change that in time. Um, but, the, the, you know, that kind of ANSOP matrix of where do you go next? You can either you know, invest in the product and really kind of optimize its usage in the customer base we have, uh, or look at another market. So the, the next 18 months is the former. We're like really optimizing the product and integrating into those verticals in the UK. And the following on 18 to you know, three years out is potentially that other new market that we're currently scoping. Okay, exciting, exciting stuff. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm gonna open up the floor for questions. Answer so if anyone have any questions. Yeah. Um, congrats on, on, on your business. And um, just with regard to funding, the fact that you are selling the UK, so you'd be seen as an export, yeah. would that make it easier to get funding, in your opinion, than if you were to uh, had only focus on the Irish market? Um, in, in our world, yes, because even if we were to sell to all of healthcare in Ireland, the return on investment would never be at the same scale as it would be within the UK. <coughs> so, yeah, I think. The remit certainly for the likes of Enterprise Ireland, and you know, I'm not an expert, but it is around how many Irish heads can you employ, and it, have you got an export, uh, you know, potential on, on your roadmap. Um, so yeah, I mean, for us, we didn't have a choice. As I said, I'd like to have sold in Ireland first and then gone abroad, but we had to go abroad first. Uh, and I do think that that the focus will still be to build out on the Irish team alongside the team in the UK. So we have a wholly owned UK subsidiary and we're you know, building out the team there as well. Okay, great question. It was probably around about the time that we secured HPSU and crowdfunding. There was enough financially there for me to give up my day job. And there was enough validation there from the customer base that we were engaging with that, yes, this was a product that they would pay for. And that gave me the reassurance to go, right, okay, I'm happy to move into this arena completely. Um, so, yeah, that's a challenging one because it, it, there is quite a bit of work to get to that point. And it's about how do you stay focused on building something while potentially working in another role. Um, so for me, it was handy in that like I was still working in the healthcare space. I was working as a physio, but I was building a health tech product. Um, and I think for most entrepreneurs and founders, that is the, the case. They are sort of still in the vertical that they're building something into uh, to solutionize in that vertical. Um, so I was lucky in that regard. Um, in terms of your first few hires, uh, what importance did you put on it and what did you look for in that? Yeah, so I, I would, um, I know it's such a cliche, the whole piece about like hire slowly, fire fast, but I would really take my time. Um, and if you can find a way to suss out if it's a nice dynamic uh, with very little risk first. So it could be something like an internship. It could be a consultancy model. It could be a temporary contract so that you're not tying yourself into something that may not work out. So I've had quite a few of our team came to us from internship programs. They were in masters, you know, uh, in graphic design or UI UX, and they're now really sort of talented staples in our team. And um, a couple of the consultants that I worked with on a consultancy contract have come in as employees subsequently. So I would say that the only way to really see if someone's a fit is to work together. Like, you know, people come in, particularly commercial, salespeople, they, they, they sell really well. So in an interview, you go, God, this guy's going to sell my tech and he's going to be amazing. Um, and then that might not come to fruition, you know. So, so interviews and references are great, but my, my best way of validating is actually spending time with that individual in one way or another that's low risk for you. And then you said you took on a founder, co-founder as well. Yeah. Uh, was that a tough decision? Um, how did you validate that that was going to work? 
Yeah, that, that kind of was just serendipity. Like I said, we were both on the same New Frontiers program. Um, I had done quite a bit of validation. He wasn't sure yet about his own product taking off and it just worked out. Um, and I think that's also a lesson in, you know, go to those networking events. You know, you just don't know, like you might have a, an accidental conversation. In fact, our recent deal with the private provider was over coffee at an Enterprise Ireland event. Do you know what I mean? So, so sometimes it's hard and you go, gosh, should I be really going to this, another networking? But that's where you meet and that's the opportunity to have those serendipitous conversations that might go your way. Yeah, we've even had a few people match up actually on further um, yeah, this, this program, sitting next to each other. Any other questions? I have uh, just one last question, exiting. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, is this your, you know, is there a serial entrepreneur in there or, you know, would you like to go on and invest in other companies or, or are you planning an exit strategy or what's the kind of, what's your take on it? Yeah, um, for me, I mean, we, we've got a target of what we want to, what our annual recurring revenue is going to be. And I have that, that's my North Star as well. So I want to reach that annual recurring revenue target. And at that point, I might consider where to next. Absolutely, I'd love to see, you know, like there is a fantastic entity called Awaken Hub and they are female investors um, and women who tech. So I, I would, be, you know, be very keen to support entrepreneurship in Ireland if it came to the point in time where, where I could financially do that, for sure. I'd love to, you know, it, it's kind of, in a way, we're sort of adrenaline junkies, aren't we, when, when we own our own businesses. And I don't see myself ever stepping away from, the, you know, I, I feel very passionate about growing and creating uh, something meaningful. I think it's really nice in the ecosystem because there is such a lot of goodwill like even you coming here today to talk to people and founders do want to give back and they do want to they're happy to come and give their time and and likewise as you say so many uh great things have come out of being in the ecosystem going to these programs going to events so i think that's something that's yeah. as you say just you need to get out of the building you need to get out and meet people and things can happen from that so Anyway, thank you so much for being with us today and it was such a pleasure and thanks for sharing your story. Thank you. Thanks for having me.